Well, hello, and welcome to the Blavatnik School of Government. It's a real pleasure to have you with us today. And I'm delighted to be hosting someone that many of us in the Blavatnik School know very well, Tun, uh, Tansri Nazir Razak, who's been um, a transformational leadership fellow at the school on course, uh, thinking about how to make a better Malaysia and what other countries can learn from that, but also a member of our International Advisory Board. Can I just say to all of you joining us today that please do submit your questions and comments and suggestions through the Q&A function um, in, your, in your viewer so that we can pick up those questions and thread them through the discussion. Tansri Nazir Razak, the man who took one of Malaysia's smaller banks and made it into one of the largest in the region. A man who's a restless but careful, considered builder of institutions. Someone who deeply, deeply cares about his country. Every page of this truly great read um, tells you about that. And today, chair of one of Malaysia's largest development finance institutions, and working on that part of how to help Malaysia strengthen itself. Let's move straight to our speaker. You're the son of a former Malaysian prime minister. You're the brother of a much more controversial Malaysian prime minister. I guess the question in everybody's heads when they saw this book come out, Nazir, was, is this a political move? Why did you write this book? Thanks, Ngari. Well, first of all, uh, thank you uh, for having me. And, you know, I couldn't think of a more appropriate way of uh, introducing my book outside Malaysia uh, than doing it at uh, uh, BSG. Um, as you know, I spent uh, um, a year um, doing my fellowship and, uh, and writing the book as well. Uh, and uh, I remember being in my third floor room um, with uh, my friend Charles Ledbetter and brainstorming uh, all the ideas uh, behind uh, this book. And of course, section five, which was all about the future of Malaysia um, um, from my perspective, uh, was really uh, drawn from the work I did uh, uh, on the Transformational uh, Leadership uh, Fellowship uh, that I did uh, with the school. The, it started really, be, uh, the whole book idea started because I felt uh, that, you know, uh, sad that my father uh, never wrote his memoirs or never had a chance uh, to write his memoirs. He died uh, at the uh, age of 53 uh, at the height uh, of his uh, power and, and busyness. Uh, so he never got the chance to put it down on paper. And it's such an important medium uh, for future generations uh, to, to, to become better, uh, to be able to read uh, about the past. And so it's always been in my mind that if I get the chance uh, and if I, you know, uh, could write something interesting, I would. And so uh, towards the end of my CIMB career, I was thinking of writing this book. And then when I retired, I realized that I would end up writing a book that nobody would probably read, uh, apart from a few CIMB alumni. Um, so it was kind of on the shelf. Uh, then, of course, you know, the, the past few years, things accelerated with um, the fall uh, in government, uh, the Malaysian, uh, the, the uh, Barisan National Government uh, fell for the first time in 61 years. Uh, and of course, there was the whole 1MDB scandal uh, and everything around uh, those uh, events. Uh, so then I got together uh, with, with, with Charles and a few others and sort of brainstormed, can, can we, do we really have a good story to tell? Uh, can we write it in a way that people will want to read? Uh, and that's when, uh, you know, sort of middle of 2019, we said, yes, yes, we can. Uh, and I, uh, you know, we started, uh, I started writing in earnest uh, at that point. And, you know, after a couple of years, uh, we got uh, to uh, launch the book. And of course, you know, some people have brought up the issue of you launching a political career, uh, but absolutely not, because if you read the book, uh, it clearly uh, is, you know, almost uh, a declaration that I, will, I don't want to go into politics. I want to contribute to changing uh, politics in the country because I think that's what the country needs most. And Nazir, you, you, you mentioned the 1MDB scandal and you were early out of the blocks, um, both privately and publicly in Malaysia, saying, look, is this what Malaysia needs? Is there something wrong with this um, sovereign wealth fund that's being created? 
But how, how hard was it writing about that, knowing that the prime minister at the time was, was your older brother? Was, how, how do you go about that? How do you balance these loyalties to your family and to your country? Well, I think, you know, uh, it's hard, firstly, uh, but two, uh, the book is uh, all about this, these, these, these tensions um, between, that I faced between, you know, loyalty uh, to uh, my brother, uh, but also loyalty to my understanding of my late father's legacy. Um, so the first section of the book is about the Tun Raza legacy uh, and my view uh, that, um, you know, there are two parts of his legacy, the tangible uh, and the intangibles. The tangible being the institutions and his and policies um, and the intangibles being his values and his methods. And my argument uh, is that Malaysia uh, has uh, done a disservice to itself by trying to defend uh, too much his tangible legacies, uh, which were for the, his time and for the challenges then, uh, and not for what uh, we need today. What we should focus on is uh, his values uh, and his methods. Uh, and as I distill those, I feel, you know, I felt that, you know, to honor uh, those values uh, and his methods, uh, I had to basically step up and 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 say that you know there's something uh, wrong uh, with one uh, MDB, even though uh, it you know uh, result it, it was awkward uh, uh, to say the least uh, for my brother. When you, when you talk about the tangible legacy of your father and the values of your father, are you talking about the Bumiputra policies? Are you talking about the policies which gave Malaysians a special place? in um, Malaysia's development and, and what the values, could you, could you just tell it, explain that a little bit more for, for this audience? Well, the, the, his tangible legacies, uh, it's a very long list uh, because, you know, he was there uh, next to the uh, Tunku Rahman, who was our first prime minister uh, fighting for independence. Uh, he wrote uh, what was what is known as the Razak Report, uh, which essentially uh, set the stage for Malaysia's education policies uh, he negotiated, he was, he, he chaired the, the, the committee uh, of uh, what we call the Alliance Party, uh, the precursor to Barisat National, uh, in the negotiations uh, with the Reed Commission uh, for the original constitution of Malaysia. Uh, and so, you know, and of course, you know, uh, in 1970, when he became prime minister after uh, the race riots, uh, he essentially recalibrated uh, nationhood. Uh, he reset the nation with uh, new policies. One of them uh, was the, uh, accept the, the the kind of amplification of affirmative action. Uh, don't forget the special privileges for uh, the indigenous people is there enshrined in the constitution. Uh, he basically uh, ramped it up uh, by mobilizing the state uh, in order to achieve uh, the rebalancing uh, of uh, wealth in society. Uh, and there were also other elements of that recalibration, including um, the formation of a grand coalition government, uh, as well as the, the, the launch of national principles, um, a very public document about what it means to be uh, Malaysian in terms of you know, racial unity and so on and so forth. So uh, that whole package uh, 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 was very much what happened uh, in, in, in the kind of 1970. So I, you know, I described him as the master builder of the nation because he did so much. Uh, and in 1970, you know, he did so much uh, to kind of design Malaysia 1.0 uh, when we had independence, and he did so much uh, to drive uh, Malaysia 2.0, uh, which was in 1970 after uh, the race riots. And those were kind of the foundations uh, for the Malaysia um, uh, that we still have today. Uh, so central to that uh, argument uh, is that Malaysia today is still operating on the 2.0 system. And I think my father will be the first one to say that 2.0 system doesn't work anymore. You know, um, there's lots of uh, evidence that he and his colleagues then uh, thought that 2.0 should be around for maybe 20 years uh, and it would have to be reformed in accordance with what Malaysia needs then. It's been 50 years. And I think this system that he put in place has had a lot of side effects, negative side effects that I think uh, have, have come to the fore uh, and it really is at the heart of Malaysia's dysfunctions today. And Malaysia, um, and uh, Malaysia, tell us about what Malaysia 3.0 looks like for you. Your book ends with Malaysia renewed, um, but tell us what, what 
give us a snapshot of your vision of, of what Malaysia needs to move towards the 3.0. Well, I, I gave a short, uh, I think four or five pager uh, that I call Malaysia Renewed, you know, a kind of very positive vision of, you know, outward looking, um, um, you know, um, inclusive uh, Malaysia uh, and, 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 and one, you know, where our young are multilingual uh, and our young are embracing 4.0 and so on and so forth. Uh, but I think Irene, what's more important is the path I envisage uh, to the future. And it is a future that I think that needs to be designed uh, in a very methodical way. Uh, and this is where uh, you know, the, the work I did at BSG is all about uh, embracing deliberative democracy as the path uh, to that future. I mean, I cannot say, I can say what I would like Malaysia to be, but you know, it's not up to me. I think we need to get uh, the good, uh, what I'd like to say, uh, uh, the good, the great, and the ordinary uh, Malaysians together uh, to deliberate what future they want uh, and the path of that future. And here, you know, I'm pushing uh, this idea uh, of embracing deliberative democracy. And how do you stop that being a majoritarian view? You know, so so how do we in a in a time when you know what's changed since your father's times, um, and and changed very sharply in the last few years in every country of the world is a rise of a very very powerful identity politics, and Malaysia of course is caught in the spiral of that with politicians that used to promote a kind of cohesive all nation Malaysia becoming quite virulently kind of you know, identity driven in their politics. So if, if, if Malaysia is to shift to a deliberative democracy, how, how do you balance the minorities that you want to give voice to? Well, I think this is a process of uh, redesigning a system. Our problem today is majoritarianism is growing by the day. Um, and uh, you see this great shift uh, over the past you know, 10, 20 years driven by uh, identity, uh, which is race and religion. Uh, so that's a very toxic mix. Uh, and I think that we need to sit down uh, and um, deliberate what kind of an inclusive society we want to be uh, going forwards. Uh, and I think, you know, looking at the, the literature on um, uh, the deliberative process, uh, it really excites me. Uh, one is in 1970, when my father, ironically, when they came up with affirmative action, it was through a deliberative process. They generally believed that affirmative action was needed to create the foundations of national unity. Because at that time, the Malays, who were, you know, sort of 60% of the population, uh, owned 2% of wealth. It was not sustainable. So mobilize the state, uh, rebalance wealth. Uh, and in a way that Malays had a bigger share of growth rather than taking from non-Malays, it was giving Malays a bigger share of growth. That was the policy design. And the implementation of affirmative action then, many of my father's senior officers were actually non-Malays. They truly believed that you needed to do this rebalancing be before uh, you can talk seriously about integration and creating uh, a, Malay a Malaysian race as opposed to being Malays, Chinese or Indians first, we are Malaysians first. That was the, the plan. Uh, and, you know, that has, uh, um, uh, you know, it had initial success, uh, but I think the affirmative action uh, uh, lasted too long and instead uh, it strengthened identity politics. It created more opportunities for corruption and it facilitated concentration of power. So these three elements I call the three-headed monster uh, that rules our country today. And I, and, and, and I think that in order uh, to unwind or, or to slay this three-headed monster, uh, we need to go through a deliberative process. Um, and here, you know, I, I, I reflect on 1970 going through a deliberative process, um, but today it's ironic that all across the world, um, uh, countries are looking to deliberative platforms um, a, to enhance democracy in their frustration at the, 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 the kind of limitations of representative democracy. Uh, and I think Malaysia could certainly benefit uh, from this whole process. Um, because I think, you know, 
these polarizing issues, um, if you stay in your echo chambers, uh, you're never uh, going to come with positive solutions and compromises. But if you bring people with uh, 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 contesting ideas together, get to know each other, get human contact, uh, and discuss and look for positive solutions, uh, I think we could get there. Now we've we've sort of accelerated through to the end of the book, um, but partly what you're bringing to that vision of a Malaysia is an understanding of how to build communities of people and build institutions, which this book sort of shows us you doing in in the commercial sector in a bank and um can you share with us some of the lessons um for those on this call who are trying to build institutions or dreaming of building institutions you know you come into cimb as a junior person and you know you begin to kind of watch and look and learn but what are some of the lessons that you drew out about you know how to how to make an institution stronger, more effective, more responsive? Yeah, many, many things. Um, I mean, one, of course, is the power of diversity, uh, which I learned. And that's just not for Malaysia, uh, but that's for everywhere, uh, which is, you know, the, the very human uh, instinct of, you know, cloning, uh, where we like, the leaders like to hire people who are look like them, uh, uh, talk like them, share the same values with them, uh, and so on. And, and, and really, uh, one real challenge is, you know, to teach your leaders uh, to create powerful teams, uh, to embrace diversity, uh, and to look for, um, you know, people who are different, but also maybe even smarter than them in order to bring strong teams. And I felt that, you know, uh, there are many, many uh, leaders in CIMB today who will recall uh, my kind of evaluation of them. And I used to always beat them up uh, about, you know, it's all about hiring uh, the right team. Uh, that's one. Uh, two, in terms of um, mergers and acquisitions, CIMB, I think, you know, uh, in total, there were about 13 financial institutions uh, that we kind of brought together over the years to create a CIMB. And every time, uh, there were uh, merger challenges, uh, etc. And uh, one thing I, I, I discovered is what's powerful is when an organization is not doing well is to imbue the sense of discontinuity right across the organization uh, to, you know, kind of imbue the sense that all of us have to embrace change. Uh, and uh, that can be uh, a very you know, powerful method of organization renewal. Uh, and, you know, I compare that to, you know, what we are, uh, I'm advocating for Malaysia as a whole, you know, to, to, to create this national sense of discontinuity uh, and need to start afresh because uh, things are, are not going uh, so right. Yeah. And, um, sorry, Kara. Sorry, uh, Nazi, you talk about um, imbuing the sense of discontinuity, but to be strong, doesn't an institution need a culture and some sense also of continuity and and trust and, and how, how do you balance those two things? Well, discontinuity is a temporary phase um, where, you know, you, you basically say, okay, look, uh, let's recognize that things are not working well. Uh, so everyone uh, must embrace change uh, for this period. Uh, and everyone must be open to new ways of doing things. Uh, and then you basically um, uh, then and go through, uh, make all those changes. And then you say, okay, uh, now uh, it's time uh, for us to move forward. And we forget about discontinuity. Uh, we start thinking about continuity, right? Um, and your story has you taking some pretty audacious risks. Um, you know, some of which come off fantastically and some of which you're very frank and honest about, you know, are difficult. How do you take those risks? What's your own way of deciding, right? this great big move I'm gonna make, actually this one I'm not. Tell us about that. <laughs> I mean, to be honest, Mary, if I, if I was uh, at this age uh, trying to do that, I wouldn't. Uh, and I was, you know, uh, in a way, you know, youth uh, is, is important in this uh, uh, somehow. Uh, I, at that time, I was much, much more daring than I am now. Um, that's one thing I have to admit. Um, I think every time uh, you move, uh, you have to um, calculate the risk rewards. Uh, that's for starters. Uh, and I think that um, you have to 
this is a bit, you know, uh, uh, can be counted to, but you have uh, to be willing uh, to accept failure. Um, you and your board have to be willing to accept failure because if you don't accept that you might fail, uh, you are going to be too risk averse. And I think that's what have, that's what's happening to a lot of organizations today. And a lot of large organizations uh, find it hard to move because, you know, they don't want to take risks. Uh, and, you know, you also have to build a culture where uh, if people make mistakes, it's okay so long as they had the right motivations. Uh, and, you know, they actually um, made the right uh, calculations. Right and things go wrong and you have to accept. Uh, once you, you build that culture, we can make mistakes, uh, but we must be brave and bold. Uh, then I think uh, that's the a way you can you know really, really move dramatically as we did. Uh, we went from you know this small investment bank in 1989 when I joined. We were 69 people. You know towards the end we were 40 over thousand uh, people. That's the scale of our transformation and through the journey you know, many right decisions, but, you know, a few wrong decisions. And and I think, you know, I, I keep telling people that one of the threads in the book uh, is um, the importance of the long lens uh, when you look at a career. Uh, there's, you know, people are too uh, eager to look at mistakes. You know, they pick on people making these mistakes or that mistakes. That's wrong. You must look at the long lens. Everybody makes mistakes. You know, in your book, you don't dive very much into the Razak family, you know, uh, dinner table. That's to say you and your siblings. And for those reading your book, you know, there's, it's this pretty extraordinary spectacle of the children of a former, uh, uh, the children of a prime minister who must have been sitting around there debating. And when you look at the debates through 1MDB and then today through to what Malaysia might look like, you realize, you know, there's differences of view and differences of experience within this family. Um, are these issues that you and your siblings debate? And did you debate them as kids? <laughs> Actually, no. I mean, we're quite, you know, far apart in terms of age and we're quite hierarchical. Um, and, um, you know, like Najib and I, we're 13 years apart uh, and we never really spend that much time uh, together. Uh, so whilst we're close, um, you know, um, I don't, you know, and, and we did discuss um, politics, etc., uh, from time to time. Uh, but I wouldn't say um, we have the kind of conducive uh, um, uh, relationship for, you know, sort of intense debates. <laughs> right, right. And look, last question for me, and please, as an audience, do make use of the Q and A function um, to bring your questions to this discussion. Um, but let me now ask about the region because Nazir, among business leaders from the region, you know, you've done as much, if not more, than any other in thinking about ASEAN and the Asia region and cooperation across the region, not least because you took CIMB out across the region. Um, and you know, you've 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 watched as Malaysia has made its way within quite a changing Asian region. T tell us about what are the opportunities and risks for Malaysia today that come from the region in which it sits? Well, I think, you know, uh, my ASEAN experience was, was, was tough because we embraced um, uh, the whole notion of an ASEAN economic community uh, in uh, 2007. And we decided to, you know, uh, try and, um, you know, be the trailblazer in building a regional company. Uh, we built this truly uh, regional uh, organization, uh, but then all the promises in terms of liberalization of cross-border movement of people, capital and all that never quite came through. You know, ASEAN launch is ASEAN economic community on schedule more or less uh, in uh, at the end of 2015, but it didn't look like the single production base uh, with free movement of people that was promised uh, at all. Uh, but I think Malaysia still needs to uh, push uh, and and encourage the integration of the regional economy. Uh, we are uh, one of the smaller economies of the region uh, in terms of of of, of um, uh, population, um, and I think that in many respects, um, our 
um, uh, you know, one of the, the, the key uh, ways of attracting uh, investment to Malaysia is the ability for companies to then access the ASEAN market. Uh, and that's something uh, we need to do uh, in collaboration with, you know, uh, other um, smaller ASEAN economies. Um, I think that uh, cross-border uh, investment can be very lucrative and Malaysian companies do very well because of our um, second nature uh, of being very diverse uh, and uh, therefore uh, we need to you know we need to build on economic integration so that we can great have greater access uh, to other markets uh, in the region uh, as well so you know I'm very much in favor of, of Malaysia uh, pushing ahead with regional integration thank you thank you Nazir look I'm going to bring in some questions from others um, and the first is from uh, Maya Tudor, who is, as you know, uh, a professor here at the Blavatnik School of Government. Maya, come in and ask your own question. Great. Thank you. And um, Nazir, I'm very much looking forward to, to reading the book. I haven't yet, I must confess. So that's coming. Um, so my question is, is for people who don't know Malaysia as well as you do, but who can learn from Malaysia's experience of grappling with um, identity politics and an identity politics that um, all societies as they diversify are grappling with. And, you know, Malaysia's diversity and ethnic diversity doesn't need to be a liability. So long as that identity, those ethnic diversity can be subsumed within a more encompassing Malaysian identity. And so my question to you is, if you have specific and concrete ideas about <clears throat> how you create that inclusive identity, if there are particular symbols, particular stories in Malaysian history that can serve as the basis for a, a kind of encompassing identity, which doesn't reject in a kind of zero sum way ethnic diversity, but, but allows it to be included within a more encompassing identity that can also be harnessed. Thank you. Sure. I mean, I think you, one, one has to be uh, honest about uh, history. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, there are, well, fortunately, there are some stories, but uh, in the main, you know, under colonialism, we were pretty much kept separate, uh, the three races. Uh, and that was part of our uh, problem in at the time of independence, you know, trying to uh, integrate um, three uh, communities or, or races that actually were kept very, very separate. Uh, and even um, in terms of where we live, but also in terms of the work we did. Uh, and then you had the situation where, you know, the, the, the Chinese own a large tracts of the economy uh, and the Malays were generally in, in the administrative service. Uh, and many of the Indians were, were basically, you know, in professional services or uh, plantation workers. And uh, so trying to integrate that uh, and to create um, uh, stories around that, uh, I think there's limited power. Uh, but I think that um, we can actually create positive stories in terms of uh, situations where um, Malays, Chinese, Indians have actually come together to create powerful teams. Uh, we have a we had a movie a few years ago called Ola Bola, uh, where you know Malaysia qualified uh, for the you know uh, Olympics uh, in football. Uh, and, and the team then uh, was very multi-ethnic. Uh, and, you know, the, the, the whole movie talked about the power uh, of that diversity. And if you look at um, uh, CIMB, um, it was, uh, I would say CIMB became very successful because uh, we were able uh, to you know, bring the best uh, of the various um, uh, ethnic groups uh, in, in, and people used to, uh, joke that CIMB actually stands for Chinese Indian Malay Bank. Uh, and I was very proud when people used to call CIMB that. Although, as you can imagine, therefore, the Malay nationalists, many of them didn't like what I was doing. Yeah, uh, they felt that, you know, why are you making this bank so multi-ethnic uh, when, you know, this is, you know, owned by the government, so therefore it has to be more of a Malay bank. Um, and, and as I said, you know, I used to fight this whole a notion of um, 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 you know tribalism or hiring people uh, of the same race and, and 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 so on and so forth. 
Uh, so I think, you know, uh, and it's not just uh, CIMB, you know, the companies like Air Asia uh, and so on, of course, you know, people, uh, it's difficult to say airlines are doing well now, uh, but there was a time when, you know, uh, they built a tremendous brand by uh, bringing uh, truly multi ethnic. So I think on the corporate side, uh, there are a lot of these examples. So sports, um, um, companies, um, businesses, uh, but also I think in, in, um, uh, in arts uh, and culture, I think there will there are uh, stories that we can build up. And I agree with you, Maya, in order to create uh, the sense of nationhood, we need to relook at the narrative. And unfortunately, um, you know, uh, religion is playing its part now uh, in kind of shifting the narratives. And we need to regain uh, that hold on the stories that make, make up what Malaysia truly is. Thank you, Nazir. I'm now going to give uh, you two questions in a cluster. So one is from a guest online, Fadi Amin, who writes, I'm a Malaysian and it's easy to feel really discouraged about what's happening in Malaysia since 1MDB. You're clearly a very influential and highly networked person, but beyond the book, what are you and other influential Malaysians who benefited from Malaysia 1.0 and 2.0 doing to empower and to pave the way for young Malaysian professionals towards renewed Malaysia? And um, so that's Fadi Amin. And then I'm going to bring in, in person, um, an alumna from the Blavatnik School of Government. We're very proud of her, Alicia Aslan from Malaysia, who graduated with distinction from our Master of Public Policy last year. Alicia, lovely to see you. What's your, I think your question is in a similar vein. So come on camera and ask your question. Thank you so much, Nairi. And yeah, I apologize for the similar type question, but I mean, it's, it's along the same vein because, you know, I really do agree with you that I think emboldening um, the youth of Malaysia is, is what's needed. I mean, I'd add on to that. I think actually also emboldening women, I think Malaysia needs a lot more female politicians actually to think about enacting change and getting different points of view, things of that nature. But, you know, it's been three years since the fall of uh, BN and, the current situation in Malaysia is, I think, it seems regressing back to its pre 1MDB status, you know, so BN is back in power. Uh, corruption is rampant, you know, like um, Azim Bak uh, Baki scandal. And uh, more distractingly, you know, there's been uh, no accountability really for the people responsible for 1MDB. Um, in some, I think the Malaysian uh, youth, you know, people my age, I'm back in Malaysia now, but I feel like we're losing hope again. Um, not, not many people want to take action. They're just like, oh, it's, it's back to what it was, right? Um, so how exactly do you think, or, or what sort of specific messaging uh, should we use to inspire the youth of Malaysia to enact change? Thanks, Alicia. Thank you. Nazir, hope for the youth. Well, I think certainly don't give up. I think certainly, um, you know, we've, we've only just allowed uh, the youth to vote. Uh, we've just passed legislation for um, 18 uh, to be the new threshold for voting. So the dynamics uh, at the next general election uh, will be quite different uh, and pol political parties and politicians will have to take, to take uh, certainly uh, more note uh, about uh, the youth going forwards. Um, and I think that both uh, to both questions uh, is this, that, uh, you know, um, me and my um, friends uh, are uh, trying our level best uh, to contribute. Uh, and, you know, people have called me and said, you know, if you really want to contribute, go into politics, etc. But that's precisely what I shouldn't be doing. Uh, as I said at the beginning, what I want to do is try and change politics. And that's why, you know, in, in, at the end, in November, I wrote to uh, the King about this idea of setting up this Better Malaysia Assembly, uh, introducing deliberate democracy, because I think this is the way forward. And, you know, if it's left to me, I would certainly want to populate the um, Assembly with uh, lots of youth. I mean, the future is for you guys. Uh, and, you know, um, I think that uh, we cannot leave uh, structural change uh, long-term issues uh, to parliament, uh, to politicians, to partisan politics. We can't. Uh, they just cannot compute uh, some of these uh, issues. Uh, and when they when 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 they debate, uh, it's very very hostile. And uh, Nairi and Maya will remember. I took twenty-five quite 
diverse Malaysians to Oxford uh, in 2016. Uh, and, uh, you know, we basically said, look, put, you know, leave behind your political affiliations. Let's just talk about how to build a better Malaysia. And it was quite interesting because I was looking around the room. I said, these guys, if they were in parliament, they'll be shouting at each other, right? And, and not getting anywhere. But in a room where we just put our affiliations uh, aside and we just focus on issues and what are the best answers or the best compromises for the future of the country, uh, we really got somewhere. Uh, and, you know, I really am a big believer uh, in this deliberative democracy for Malaysia. I just need to get it done. Uh, and I need uh, the parliament, I need the politicians to back me uh, or to back us to set up this uh, assembly. And I hope that uh, uh, the youth will also do. I mean, Said Sadiq, who leads the youth party, the new youth party of Malaysia, uh, has stepped forward and made very public his support for the Better Malaysia Assembly. Uh, so has the uh, uh, Democratic Action Party uh, leader, Lim Kit Siang. So we are slowly uh, getting more support uh, from the politicians, but some of them have come up and said, "Look, you know what? What? What are we redundant? Uh, why? Why? Why do we need this other assembly? Because this is our job. Why are you taking our job? So this is something uh, we need to uh, get over. Uh, and meanwhile, on your question about uh, women and youth, I mean, I've actually publicly made a proposition that every board in Malaysia should have a seat for uh, the youth." Uh, you know, we already encourage boards to be at least 30% uh, female. Uh, why not also say uh, there are seats for youth? Uh, because I think given the, the, the gap between generations today, uh, why not every board have a young person? Uh, and I think that's something uh, I also uh, want to pursue and I believe is in, going to be in uh, Muda's uh, manifesto uh, as well going forwards. And Nazia, SK Core, thank you for that answer. SK Core asks in a, in a sort of follow on from that, how would you position the Better Malaysia Assembly vis a vis the existing institutions like Parliament, the existing political parties, the government, and the monarchy? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I just wrote an article uh, this weekend. It's in The Edge for those of you who have uh, access to it, The Edge Reuters uh, uh, magazine, and basically explaining that. You know, the early criticism of um, the Better Malaysia was about elitism, was about uh, undermining democracy uh, and about um, uh, monarchy overreach uh, and so on. And, uh, you know, I really think um, people were just instinctively hostile uh, to, you know, something that looked very radical. Uh, if they actually read uh, the letter we sent, uh, NSK, uh, you also signed the letter, uh, we wrote uh, this letter to the king. It was very clear uh, that, you know, uh, this is about enhancing our dem democracy. Whatever is deliberated and recommended by uh, this assembly would have to uh, go through parliament uh, for implementation. Uh, and that this assembly cannot uh, be set up by the monarchy. It has to be set up by uh, all the institutions uh, together. Um, so, you know, I think that, you know, I really hope that once people uh, are very clear uh, that we're not trying to undermine everybody, all we're trying to do uh, is get better ideas for a better Malaysia, uh, then people will be more and more uh, open to this. Thank you, Nasia. I'd like to bring in Tony Cole, another Transformational Leadership Fellow alum from the Blavatnik School. Uh, Tony. Your question. Hello, Nazir. Thank you, Naya. Uh, so, Nazir, I, I used to run a business um, in the energy space and transited into politics. But I do remember that I got a lot of uh, flack uh, saying that business should not fraternize with politics. And so, my question to you is do you think big business like the one you've run? should have absolutely nothing to do with politics and just focus on business and let politicians focus on politics? Or do you see benefit in big business and politics working together for a better Malaysia, better society? No, I think there are positive ways that businesses can uh, work with the government. Um, I think there's a distinction between government and politicians here. Uh, I think what we don't want uh, is uh, politicians to use businesses. Uh, but I think to the extent that government collaborates with business uh, to do good things uh, for the nation, uh, I'm all for it. Um, I think in, in Malaysia, um, I have 
said in public that my problem with Malaysia is we don't have an economy. We only have a political economy. Uh, and the link between politics uh, and business is so, so deep uh, that, you know, that is actually part of the reason why the system is so hesitant to reform. Is it fair to call it crony capitalism? Um, well, I think, you know, uh, there is an element of that. Uh, but I think, you know, it depends how you define crony capitalism. Sure. Uh, because I think, you know, crony capitalism in Malaysia can go to the extreme of just, you know, politicians appointing uh, their cronies. Uh, it's not quite just that. Yeah. Uh, another question around the uh, corporate issue from Afsal Abdul Rahim, um, which, which is about business. How, what did you find more challenging? Building a business with a pan ASEAN presence? or building a well-blended leadership team from across ASEAN? What does a truly regionalized ASEAN multinational look like? Yeah, I think Abzal, the, the, the dynamic of that is that, you know, we first started and said that we must build one company throughout ASEAN. Uh, and then we needed to shift gears because ASEAN wasn't integrating. Then we said that we want to be a multi-local uh, ASEAN organization. And then that means that you actually have strong in-country leadership teams and not just rely uh, on the, uh, um, the, the head office uh, regional team, uh, if you like. Uh, so I think, you know, on, on, on hindsight, um, the bigger challenge uh, was um, to, you know, to, 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 to get the right solutions for the right time. Uh, and we transitioned uh, from this strong, you know, group leadership team uh, to then having a better balance uh, and having strong uh, domestic uh, teams. And, you know, uh, you always are constantly trying to balance uh, the two because, of course, if your, your leadership teams on shore are too strong, uh, they can start not listening to the centre uh, and, and so on. Great. And... and on, on the issue of diversity, we've got a couple of questions here. I'm going to, again, I'm going to put them together. So Janet Powell asks, Nazia, thanks for your great insights. How do you balance meritocracy with affirmative action in the deliberative democracy assembly? Modern meritocracy, which is to some extent entangled with elitism, could stoke resentment and hostility and justify identity politics in many countries. So how can deliberative democracy help to widen the criteria for people to succeed and move up the socioeconomic ladder? And then, so there's that issue of how you do it. And then there's a, 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 a related question by Vijaya Tazani Batmanat, who asks, Malaysia has yet to embrace its diversity to its full extent the Bumiputra affirmative action policies are still perceived to be synonymous with Malay affirmative policies. We still label races Indian and Chinese when, and actually ethnic names are not known. To this day, Malaysia's diversity looks like three main races in inverted commas. Tan Sri, in your personal opinion, how should we move forward to dismantle this? So, um... Vijaya, I mean, I think that's really pretty much at the heart of the, 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 the key question that Better Malaysia would have to handle. When are we going to be a Malaysian race and how do we get there? And I keep reminding people that, you know, um, I spoke to Tun Musa, who was a former Deputy Prime Minister, and he's, 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 he was there at the early days of the nation. And he keeps reminding us that we've forgotten the fact that everything was always about building a Malaysian nation. Yeah, uh, that means we will all continue to be Malay, Chinese, or Indian, but we are first a Malay. Uh, we're first Malaysians, and it, you know, even affirmative action is a step towards that ultimate goal. But we seem to have lost sight because suddenly those beneficiaries of affirmative action and say, "I'm not giving this up." Right? It's very difficult. It's like the affirmative action is like a drug. I don't think. I could ask someone in Rwanda to do the research, but I don't think we've had um, a, a real successful case of, you know, uh, weaning anyone off affirmative action. And, and so we need to have serious conversations of how we evolve this. 
whether you could say, okay, by 2030 or 2050, uh, that's when we end affirmative action uh, by race or whatever it is. There needs to be a plan and then there needs to be a time frame so that we can actually build uh, this, this Malaysian uh, nation. And uh, to Janet, um, I mean, Janet, I, 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 I totally agree with you that one needs to balance uh, meritocracy. I think, you know, there's been this shift uh, even in, in much of the academic literature uh, about, you know, uh, shift away from pure meritocracy and the uh, in the limits of meritocracy uh, and the downside uh, of people feeling that, you know, uh, they're so great because they got there based on or, or just on merit. And I think, you know, policies uh, that uh, one needs to deliberate in this better Malaysia uh, would have to also address the issue uh, of how to balance uh, merit uh, as well as fairness, inclusivity and diversity. Thanks, Nazir. Um, writing a personal history is difficult. I mean, you're writing a history that's about a family that's also about a CIMB family, as it were, and about the nation. And most people find that when they write such a history, other people are terribly annoyed because we each remember our family history differently, our business history differently. People feel they've been, you know, missed out or neglected or or, or wrongly criticized, etc. And it's in that context, I think, that. Abdul Wahid Omar asks his question. Um, he says, thanks for this session. I, I believe the vast majority of Malaysians appreciate this book, but there are a few detractors. And with hindsight, are there parts of your 358 page book that you feel you shouldn't have written? Or are there any episodes that you wish you had included? Well, Wahid, if I wanted perfection, I would never have uh, uh, published the book. <laughs> we would have been, you know, I remember my publisher saying, hey, look, you know, you can't keep uh, amending. Uh, you keep trying to improve this book. Uh, you know, there is a cutoff point and you need to move on. Uh, and so you're never going to get perfection. You've just got to go with it uh, at some point and uh, you do your best. I think uh, on hindsight, um, did I, should I have written, I know, you know, you're referring to uh, one you know, rather public uh, uh, complaint that, you know, I didn't give enough credit uh, to uh, a person, um, uh, a previous CEO of CIMB, but, you know, uh, I strongly uh, reject that uh, um, uh, notion because I, I, I think I absolutely did. Um, and beyond that, um, you know, I, I was um, just a bit sad that I couldn't include a lot of people, a lot of other people, um, I remember, you know, uh, people who have stood by me uh, 20, 30 years in CIMB, you know, I couldn't even include them, their name. Uh, because when you write a book, the other thing that's important is you've got to write it in a way that people want to read. Uh, because if you keep thinking, you know, oh, I have to just include all these names, I have to get, you know, uh, I have to be fair to this person and that person, I think you, 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 you run the risk of losing the reader. Uh, and then if people don't read your book, then you, you never get your message across. Yes, I think that's right. Um, when people ask me to read the draft of their autobiography, I always take a deep breath before agreeing. Um, in, this, in the case of this book, What's in a Name, it was actually a real pleasure. But I can think of others where several thousand pages were delivered to me, and mostly they were attempts to name check everybody that might possibly take offense. <laughs> it doesn't make for a very readable book. Um, Nazir, a, a, a question from Pauline Young. Um, what's your advice to young people um, on this call? Um, she writes, you know, there are those who say strategic patience is necessary for aspiring leaders to avoid making mistakes. What's your advice? Strategic patience. Uh, I think my advice is, as I said earlier, is, you know, dare to make mistakes. Uh, because if you don't dare to make mistakes, uh, then you'll never um, uh, take enough risk, uh, I think. Um, and, you know, I remember sometimes, you know, when, you know, bankers would come to me and say, you know, oh, we didn't uh, um, have any bad loans this year. Then I'd say, well, you probably didn't take enough risk. You know, I think that's the nature uh, of business. You have to take uh, risk. And I think in terms of a young person, yes, 
uh, you need to bide your time. You need to be, you know, you need to 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 to, to study situations. You need to get proper experience, uh, but that can go on for too long. And as I said, if I didn't, um, you know, take on the CIMB challenge when I was uh, uh, when I had the energy uh, and the and and the guts uh, to do it, uh, I I wouldn't have gone this far. A question from Suhana: Why is Islam the official religion of Malaysia? How do you envisage how do you envision the country without it? To reset Malaysia, do we need to separate religion from the country's administration? I think we need a we need to be pragmatic uh, about um, this sensitivity of religion and how one's one builds it into uh, the the into nationhood. I think clearly. Um, you know, Islam is the official religion uh, of uh, Malaysia. And I think what's more important uh, instead is to focus on the interpretations of Islam. And here I've been very supportive of um, a movement uh, by the uh, Association of uh, Islamic Youth, uh, where they are promoting what they called um, a cosmopolitan Islam, uh, where they look back uh, into the interpretation of Islam pre-colonial days, uh, when Malacca uh, was, you know, uh, the center of the region and where uh, Islam was moderate, uh, inclusive, uh, engaging, uh, uh, and so on. And if you look at Islam that ruled Spain for 800 years and so on, uh, I refuse to believe uh, that, uh, you know, uh, there is a, the, an interpretation of Islam uh, that can you know, underpin a inclusive, moderate uh, Malaysia. And then, um, Nazia, there's a cluster of questions from Kamal Badawi, from um, SK Core, and from Fadila Abdul Rahman, which are around to really realize this deliberative democracy, Malaysia 3.0, 4.0. What are the key levers, to use Fadila's uh, language, what are the key levers that need to be played? Who are the key players you need to involve? Who are the, um, or the other uh, questions, you know, who are the people that are going to oppose this and who are the people you need to really support it to make this happen? Well, I think in the end, I truly believe that this assembly will one day happen. The issue is that will we wait till things crash before it happens. That's typically how these assemblies are actually formed. If you look at what happened in Indonesia, uh, in, in South Africa and so on, in the end, you have these deliberative platforms uh, when things have totally crashed. And that's what happened to us in 1969. So the challenge now is we're saying that, look, looking at the trajectory, um, you know, we're going to get into, you know, the, 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 this is a nation uh, that is, you know, in decline. Uh, and we need to arrest that decline, and this is the way to do it. Um, so, we, but in order to really make it effective, I need the support of all institutions. Uh, with the letter, I'm starting with the monarchy. Uh, and I think, the, you know, I'm hoping the monarchy will just say uh, that this is a great idea. You know, why don't you work with the executive and parliament to make it happen? And that's our next step, uh, which is to hopefully get the support of the monarchy, which I think is an institution that thinks very long term, uh, to say, you know, move forwards. And then one needs to engage uh, the government uh, and parliament uh, to convince them that this is the way forwards. And of course, you know, if that, uh, and they're reluctant, there are already a few political parties that, you know, are willing to bring this deliberative platform into their manifestos. Uh, and then one, one needs to wait till the next general election in the next uh, 18 months, probably, uh, where, you know, hopefully the public uh, will vote in a party that supports uh, deliberative democracy. Thank you, Nazir. With just uh, two minutes left, let's come right back full circle to the title of the book. What's in a name? What is in a name for you? What is in the name Razak for you? <laughs> well, I think, you know, I wanted to find out uh, what's in that name. Uh, and I'm delighted that I went through that whole process. Uh, and I think, you know, I understood my father better and understand uh, myself uh, better. Um, a name, 
to me, in the end of the day, is a brand. Uh, we all get branded uh, in some way, uh, and it's about you know navigating um, you know the effects of that brand uh, in terms of expectations, in terms of you know good and bad impressions, etc. We have to navigate that brand, and then we have to preserve it in the best possible way. Uh, to then hand it over uh, to the next generation. That's why, That's how I look at a name. Yes, I'm not sure if I would describe what you're doing as preserving it. I would say you're reinventing and reinvigorating it. But there we go. Um, uh, Tun Sri Nazir Razak, thank you so much today. And let me just finish by encouraging you all to buy this fantastic book, uh, What's in a Name? Why do I say it's fantastic? Because it's so readable. You actually start reading it and you keep reading it. It doesn't become, you know, a, a, a work. It becomes a complete pleasure. So uh, Nazir, what a pleasure to talk with your book about you. And thank you all for participating in this discussion and for posing such terrific questions to our questioner. Thank you from all of us here at the Blavatnik School of Government. And thank you to Nazir Azak.